Harry, the letters in the New Testament from Paul are not listed in the order in which they were written. So here toward the very end of his list of letters are two very short letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Can you say a little bit about what Thessalonica was like and what the concerns may have been behind these letters? Right, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, issue of chronological order because these are probably, at least 1st Thessalonians, probably the earliest uh, bit of the New Testament mm -hmm. that we have. Thessalonica was a, a city in northern Greece, a port city, uh, and it was also on the Ignatian Way, which is the main east-west highway uh, for the Roman Empire. Uh, so it was a kind of commercial center, and it was a place that Paul visited on his so-called second missionary journey, which probably took place uh, somewhere in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. It was the second city he visited in this part of Greece, which is called Macedonia, or was called then Macedonia. It's mm -hmm. part of um, uh, the country of Greece right now. First uh, city was Philippi, and the, other, the next one was uh, Thessalonica. And the book of Acts tells us a lot about Paul's missionary activity in these places uh, and uh, the kind of resistance he had from uh, some of the local population, success on the one hand and mm -hmm. also resistance, mm -hmm. especially from uh, members of the Jewish community mm -hmm. that uh, didn't buy his, uh, his gospel message. So uh, on this missionary journey, Paul uh, hit these two sites and another one, Berea, which is a little bit to the west, and then went down to Athens and Corinth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that little visit is important for understanding Paul's chronology and also for dating uh, Thessalonian correspondence because there was a, um, a proconsul, Roman proconsul in Corinth, and we have inscriptional evidence that he was around in 51, 52. Mm -hmm. And according to Acts 18, Paul um, uh, had an encounter with this uh, yeah. proconsul. So that's a yeah. kind of peg on which okay. Pauline chronology is hung. And Paul says that he's writing uh, Thessalonians from Athens, so it's probably on this missionary journey right. before he gets to, to Corinth. Right. So that's the, uh, the circumstance. Okay. One of Paul's early communities uh, in um, the mainland of Europe on his second missionary yeah. uh, so journey. Late 40s, early 50s. Late 40s, early 50s yeah. is when okay. we dated. Mm -hmm. and, and Insofar as we can figure it out, what's he concerned about? Why, is he, why does he want to write this letter? It, it, yeah, this is a really uh, interesting uh, letter in all sorts of ways. Um, it's a very personal letter, mm -hmm. in some ways um, almost the most personal of Paul's mm -hmm. uh, letters. So we see him as a, a, as a pastor relating to um, these people that he converted and apparently spent some time with, mm -hmm. very much concerned about maintaining a relationship with them and using all sorts of language that uh, fosters that relationship and tries to reinforce it. At, at the same time, there's uh, some little pastoral theological issue mm -hmm. uh, that has arisen in connection with um, uh, the eschatological hope mm -hmm. that Paul had and that he uh, tried to uh, get his communities to, to share. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think Paul had the expectation that um, uh, Jesus was going to be coming back uh, even within his lifetime mm -hmm. uh, to set things right and to um, bring God's plan for humankind to a conclusion. A lot of early Christians thought that. Mm -hmm. And there was some concern on the part of the uh, Thessalonians that um, there were some members of their community who weren't going to participate in this. They had died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there's that uh, pastoral, doctrinal issue having to do with um, Christian eschatological hope mm -hmm. that um, uh, Paul has to uh, deal with here in First Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. But before that, he, he has uh, a lot to say about uh, his relationship with the community and what they're undergoing in terms of persecution and the like. Okay. Uh, my teacher at Yale many years ago, Paul Schubert, uh, made his reputation talking about the importance of the Thanksgiving parts of Paul's letters and suggested that they were important clues to what was going on. How does, how does the Thanksgiving work in the first part of Thessalonians? Right. Well, you hear um, in verse 2 of chapter 1, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly. So that's the beginning of uh, mm -hmm. a Thanksgiving session, section. And there were sections like that in uh, almost all of Paul's letters, mm -hmm. um, one prominent exception right. being Galatians, where he wasn't thankful, where he wasn't particularly <laughs> thankful when he was writing to that right. community. Um, and this is a kind of expansion of a, a, a simple formula that you get in personal letters mm -hmm. uh, in antiquity, and we have a lot of examples of those from uh, Greek papyri that have survived in Egypt. You know, someone's writing home um, to get some money or something or deliver news, and they say, uh, thank God I've uh, got good health or my journey went well mm -hmm. or the business has, has gone uh, favorably, and then they move on to the substance of the letter. Uh, Paul's Thanksgiving sections are uh, usually a, a little longer, a little mm -hmm. more complex, and they usually articulate some, some of the themes that he's going to be um, 
uh, insisting on later in the letter. Yeah. And that certainly is, is the case with this uh, Thanksgiving. Actually, the Thanksgiving is, um, it, both in First and Second Thessalonians, uh, a little complicated because uh, there were two points at which Paul yeah, says... Yeah, in both cases. Yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of frame a larger yeah, section. Yeah. And uh, this has led to some speculation, to, uh, are there two letters involved here, mm -hmm. or is Paul using a kind of framing device mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to contain uh, some of his, uh, his thoughts at the beginning of the letter? Okay. Well, part of what I notice he's thankful for is, is their steadfastness and faithfulness and, mm -hmm. and their participation, really, in the spread of the gospel. It seems to me that at some point he wants to say that, that the good things that have happened to the Word of God are partly his doing, but partly their doing as well. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, he certainly wants to convey the sense that uh, they are partners in this business. Okay. And um, it, that, that's something you see in a lot of his correspondence, trying to get people to, to share in the responsibility of spreading the gospel mm -hmm. and in maintaining the community among uh, Christian mm -hmm. individual communities, Christian churches. Um, we see him doing that in, in the Corinthian correspondence in particular when he's taking up the collection. Yes, right. Uh, and uh, insisting that uh, I can't do, do it without you. Yeah, yeah. And w also when he talks about his own um, uh, fundraising activity as, as an apostle, he, he always makes a point of saying, look, I, I never charge people for my services yes, while yes, I was yes. with you, uh, but now that I'm away you can support now, my mission yes, to yes, the yes, next. Yes. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's some practical And that business of his not charging and working with his own hands will come up here. Yeah with some concerns he has here. Right. And I, it seems to me also that one thing that he does, and it, it's, it's good pastoral practice, is before he comes to his suggestions to commend them on how wonderfully they're doing, as opposed to starting out, here are the three things I'm worried about, here are the mm -hmm. three questions you have. Start by saying, you've been terrific, this is wonderful, I'm grateful for our relationship, now let's build on that, rather than saying, here's where you need to shape up and here's where you've fallen right. short. Uh, no, that's, uh, he, he certainly is a person of, uh, of some, uh, uh, emotional intelligence yeah, yeah. and uh, conveying a, a positive supportive yeah. message is always a good way to begin a conversation even if at the end you're going to be right, uh, exactly, critical. Exactly, mm. exactly. Uh, talk about the fact that he doesn't just say hello I'm Paul but begins with Paul, Silvanus and Timothy. Who are Silvanus and Timothy and what do we think their role in this uh, letter might be? Uh, Paul often um, begins his letters uh, in the voice of both himself and some of his, uh, his co-workers. And we know a good deal about um, uh, Silvanus or Silas, Silas who right. seems to be his nickname, yeah. and Timothy, both from the uh, Acts of the Apostles yeah. and also from um, uh, others of Paul's letters. Uh, Silas seems to have been uh, someone who uh, was with Paul at the beginning of this missionary journey and continued with him. Timothy, he picks up uh, while he's in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Timothy apparently was the uh, son of a mixed marriage, uh, uh, mm -hmm. a Jew and a Greek, someone who bridged the kind of cultural gap that Paul is constantly dealing with yeah. in his letters. Uh, and Timothy was someone that was with Paul on a number of critical occasions. He seems to have been Paul's go-between, uh, between himself and congregations that were having difficulty. And we'll see a little later on that uh, Timothy played that role with the Thessalonians, keeping up the correspondence, keeping up the relationship. Okay. So they were close collaborators. And my hunch is that Timothy um, was largely responsible for collecting Paul's letters after Paul's death. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I can't prove that. No, but, but it's uh, a, it, yeah. 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 Uh, someone in Paul's Somebody circle. Somebody has, right. Uh, right. And yeah. uh, as you can see, Timothy is with him from the get-go yeah. with, the, with these yeah. letters. There may have been other letters that Paul wrote prior to this time, but that was before Timothy came along. Okay, yeah. So it's those letters that, uh, from this point in his uh, missionary activity, that uh, formed pa Paul's... Um, Paul's corpus, and I think oh. Timothy had something to do with that. Okay. Uh, when we look at Acts, uh, Luke, who writes Acts, or whoever writes Acts in, in Luke's name, uh, seems to emphasize time and time again that Paul starts his mission in the synagogue and then moves to occasionally to being with Gentiles. Here, when Paul writes to these people, he talks about how they moved to serving God from idols. Doesn't sound like his primary audience here are former Jews or right. members of the synagogue. It, right. Um, it, it may be that um, uh, Luke has a little bit of an idealized picture of mm -hmm. how Paul operates, but he's pretty insistent on it, mm -hmm. that yes, uh, Paul yeah. um, began his missionary activity in any city that he went to by uh, going to the, um, uh, the synagogues. Yeah. And one of the things that's uh, said about the, the reaction to Paul in Thessalonica is that a number of Greeks who were uh, reverent, uh, who were God-fearers apparently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as well as a number of women uh, latched onto it. Yeah. Um, and these were not, uh, not members, uh, Jewish members of that congregation. Right. 
uh, they, the notion that there were Gentile God-fearers that yeah. somehow worshipped with and studied with Jewish um, uh, communities uh, has been um, a matter that some scholars have been doubtful about right. for a good long time right. until uh, uh, about 20 years ago there was a, uh, an inscription discovered yes. right. uh, in Asia Minor in Aphrodisius yeah. um, which has a number of uh, it's a Jewish community yeah. inscription it has a number of people with Jewish names and then it has a list of people the, who are God fearers the support of Gentiles so I think it was a fact of life that yeah. um, Paul who thought of himself as an apostle to Gentiles got his entree to a lot of Gentiles through Jewish communities. Yeah. And so the picture in Acts is probably accurate. Yeah, okay, that's very helpful. So that, so that at least a primary part of the audience was Gentile, but they may well have been already affiliated with the synagogue. Right. So that, uh, and, but I think part of Paul's uh, global vision yeah. as an apostle was uh, inspired by passages like Isaiah 66, yeah that talk about uh, Gentiles coming and worshiping with Jews yeah, in, in the eschaton and God's yeah. good day. Uh, and I think Paul thought that that's what was happening. Yeah, in, yeah. In what we don't have right, yet right. is all the concern about what kind of obedience to the law is required. Right. We'll get that in later letters uh, where it seems to be more at the forefront. But what, what's he worried about here insofar as we tell? Something about how they understand the coming of Jesus again. It's mm -hmm. clearly important already. Well, it's interesting that the, uh, the categories he uses to frame this, this uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the th what we call the theological virtues yeah. uh, in uh, verse 3. Of yes. Faith and labor yeah. of love and steadfastness of hope. Yeah. One of the things he wants to do is to affirm what this community is all about, a community that lives with those, those values and yeah. virtues. Yeah. Um, and to assure them, especially on the point of hope, that they needn't despair over oh, the, very much so. uh, the right. particular yeah. issue that, yeah. uh, that's uh, arisen for them. Yeah. Uh, he also uses some other motifs here that he uh, uses in various places, talks about um, uh, how they, uh, the Thessalonians become imitators of himself and the other apostles. Right. And that's a very important theme in a lot of Paul's letters, yeah. that you learn to be uh, who you are as a Christian by following the example of people like himself. Who follows the example, example of, of Christ. Jesus. Right. Exactly. So there you right. Got, there's a chain a double, of imitation. A chain of imitation, yeah. Right. So he wants to reinforce yeah. that. And, and I think that part of that imitation is steadfastness and persecution. And what that means precisely here uh, is not clear to me, at least, though the Acts story helps. But that, that partly being steadfast and imitating him is not losing faith. In the times when it's easy, it would be easy to lose faith. The other, one other thing that strikes me here is when he talks about the word coming not only in word but in power and spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably the old preacher in me that wants to say that a word is not simply a word put out there for the intellect, but that it empowers and that it becomes the gift of the spirit to the people who receive it. Mm -hmm. That it's, it, and this is Isaiah too, in many ways. It's mm -hmm. a, this is mm -hmm. a word that does things, not just a word right. that makes noises. Yeah, Paul has a way with words. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. But he always uh, sort of um, denigrates his own he rhetorical he capabilities. Does. He, does. he does so massively yeah. at the opening of uh, First Corinthians, yeah. and yeah. Uh, says it's not a powerful uh, speech that he gives. It's uh, the power of God yeah. that's yeah. Uh, the evident in his right, yeah. right yeah. in his activity. So uh, a little bit of irony there. I think. A little bit of irony. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's continue uh, next time with some of the themes he wants to bring up when he talks about faith, hope, and love in this congregation. Okay.